It's a fresh new podcast today, Friday, March 22nd, 2024. I'm Crash Connell. And normally on Mondays, we do a repeat broadcast, but I'm going to give you a heads up. Monday, I will be visiting with J.B. Hickson as we overview Holy Week. Fresh new podcast on Monday. Mary Danielson is here. She made it through the snow. Ugh. Parked her dog sled outside and came in and all ready to go. Yes, and I survived the crazy people on the highway. So <laughs> that, that's the most important takeaway today. Anyway, um, yes, happy Friday. Um, great to be here today. My name is Mary Danielson. You're listening to Stand Up For The Truth. And my guest today is Don Shank. He is with the Tide Ministry. Maybe you have heard of them. Maybe you have not. Well, we are going to learn all about them today. They've been in existence for, in existence for over 75 years. They're an international Christian outreach committed to worldwide evangelism and discipleship, primarily through radio broadcasts and in multiple languages around the world, the languages of uh, the, the indigenous people uh, in that particular country. And we're going to talk about why that's important with Don a little bit later. They also offer discipleship, leadership development, church planting, mission trips. And I'm looking forward to this because... I really believe that sometimes we need to hear what God is doing around the world. Um, And that's why I love this type of program, because it gives us perspective and it helps us to know how to pray for believers in certain hotspots. And and talking to Don, uh, you know, the people on the front lines, I think that's just really important. And my takeaway on all that is there are so many people in the world, and yet one book, the Bible, and one message, the gospel, applies to each and every person who ever lived. So that is my perspective on all that today, and I'm going to open with a scripture, Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, and then we're going to pray, and then we're going to dive in with Don. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. That's our Savior. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Lord, by, uh, your word tells us that your heart is that none should perish. And we desire that you use us in these days to bring the hope of the resurrection and the assurance of eternal life to all those, Lord, who are struggling with the emptiness and futility of this life. And we pray for open doors uh, and to be ready to give an answer for our hope. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the finished work of your Son on our behalf. And we desire that our light would shine ever brighter. And we thank you that you direct our steps. And we ask that you help us to be sensitive to your spirit in all things. And we do lift up Don and his loved ones, the Tide Ministry, for much fruit and an ever-increasing heart for you, uh, for good health for him and his family and for all needs to be met. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, The Tide Executive Director, Don Shank, was born to missionary parents in what was then known as Rhodesia, And prior to joining the Tide in 2001, he served as a missionary teaching at a Bible school in Zimbabwe, Africa. In addition to lecturing in the classroom, Don served as academic dean, director of student ministries, and also developed and implemented a manual skills training program to enable rural pastors to minister bivocationally. Uh, Through 20 years living uh, uh, in Zimbabwe and numerous visits to Africa, Eastern Europe, and India as a ministry administrator and resource resource person resource person for church conferences and leadership training events he's acquired a wealth of international cross-cultural ministry experience his greatest passion is to reach people for Jesus and bring them into the church the tide.org welcome to stand up for the truth don thank you mary it's a pleasure to be here with you this morning uh, I want to tap into that wealth of international ministry experience, sort of vicariously, I guess you could say, Don. I'm a Midwest dweller, and I've only gone uh, to a different hemisphere a handful of times. And I think a world traveler such as yourself has a lot to offer the church. Now, where is the Tide located? I know it was founded in 1946 as Gospel Tide Broadcasting Association. So tell us where you are, uh, who founded it originally, uh, okay. things like that. Yes. Back in 1946, uh, World War II was winding down. Radio stations were popping up different places 
uh, where they had not been. Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. we're in South Central Pennsylvania, is one of the communities that was getting its first radio station in 1946. And there was a minister here who was pastoring a local congregation, and some of the people in his congregation encouraged him to do a radio broadcast on that station. Hmm. So on the very first day that that station opened, it was a Sunday in August of 1946, Charlie Byers was in the studio preaching live on air, and that continued uh, locally here uh, until... He passed away in 1996, but the English program continued on through 2008. It grew regionally throughout the U.S. And when Transworld Radio opened up their international broadcasting towers, Charlie had some connections with some people with Transworld Radio, and they invited him to take his program first into southern Africa, because a lot of the countries in the southern portion of Africa were once British colonies. Mm-hmm. So English is widely understood there. Why do you? So his program uh, was well received there, got a good response. They also, uh, Transworld Radio then started broadcasting into India, so he took it there. The response wasn't quite as good until they switched over to Hindi. And when they started mm-hmm. broadcasting in Hindi, in India, it just, <clears throat> it was like a light switch went on for wow. people, because God God could communicate to them in their language. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's that's where where we are. We, we're continue, we continue to be located or headquartered here in central Pennsylvania, in Chambersburg, and <clears throat> reaching out globally. In 2008, up until that point, when I joined in 2001, I joined a ministry where the board of directors was really wrestling with sort of a dual identity, the identity of having a radio ministry here in North America and also having this mission branch on the side. Hmm. But what what we found out with, in communicating with our donor base and doing surveys, people were supporting the Tide ministry primarily because of the impact it was having on the lives of people in other parts of the world. And many weren't even listening to the English broadcast. Hmm. And so we did. We did an evaluation, and we said, listen, here is, we live in an environment where there are a multitude of good Christian programs. People here in North America don't have to search to find the gospel, whether it's on, on the radio, on television, on the Internet. The gospel is readily accepted accessible here. But I, I, I'll talk a little bit more about something we want to do in regards to that later, because I'm not implying that the gospel is not needed here. It, mm-hmm. it is still needed here. Mm-hmm. Um, but we turned our focus to parts of the world, regions and people groups, where they just didn't have that access to the gospel. Mm-hmm. And we had the opportunity to provide it. Yeah. And so that's why we stopped doing the English broadcast. And now we uh, concentrate purely on sharing the gospel in other parts of the world with people in their own language. Mm-hmm. You know, I as you talk about going international uh, in the 70s and then in Hindi, uh, that and that just doesn't happen overnight. So what kind of manpower or what kind of, uh, how does God provide for that where all of a sudden now um, when you don't know Hindi but somebody does? So how, what's the connection there? How does that happen? That it is having God provides unique relationships. Mm. You know, you're asking a question which people often ask me, like, how do you, or how did you get into these countries? Yeah, how do yeah. you decide where to go? Right. And <clears throat> I sometimes use the illustration, you know, when we made that decision in 2008, uh, I remember the chairman of the board saying to me, I go out, research, find where is the low hanging fruit where we aren't, where do we need to be? And I came back with a, list of 10 different places to our board of directors. And now when I look back at that list, I think there's two places on that list that we're now broadcasting. Everywhere else were just doors opened by God in unique mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll give an example. One of those examples in, you know, we're in Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia right now, 
and looking to expand into some of the other Balkan countries, all because someone from Albania who is uh, runs a radio a Christian radio station mm-hmm. there attended a conference in the u s where they received some information about our ministry and the church planting that we've been doing in India. And they said, we need that in Albania. So they contacted mm-hmm. us, and through a couple years of communicating and getting to know each other, and I eventually went to visit Albania, learned to meet some church planting pastors there, and subsequently we're on the ground in Albania. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, so, so there's no set pattern, but there are things that we look for, and we are very open to God opening the doors. Yeah, yeah. wow. I love hearing about stuff like that and how God is working through ministries and in other parts of the world, because that is his heart. You know, he, he wills that none would perish, and that is his heart, and, and we worship a Savior, and that's what he does. So I, I love hearing this sort of thing. Now, how important is it? to have these programs in their language as opposed to just translating English. Um, It seems to me that having it in their language would be optimal, but tell us exactly why that is so. Yeah, and it's, you know, to to make that distinction there, which you stated, we are not taking Charlie's messages and translating them. Okay. Well, you know, we, we work to find somebody in the country who has been personally impacted by the gospel and has a sense of call, and we equip them and help train them to be able to present the gospel through media. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it provides a very culturally relevant presentation of the gospel, and people hear this now not, or they receive it not as a foreign influence, but as a God who relates directly to them. Oh, that's a good answer. Um, it's it's amazing, you know, how people can, even when, for me, I am i don't have the gift of tongues to speak in other languages. Mm-hmm. So I go into mm-hmm. these other countries, I have to have somebody translating for sure. me. Mm-hmm. But I've talked to people, and, and I grew up uh, in southern Africa, in, in, uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, it was Rhodesia when I was growing up. Uh, and I know people there. There are different groups and different language groups. And even if one learns to speak the language of the other, they can t- still say, you know, okay, that guy is claiming to be in Debele, but I can tell by the way he's talking, he's really Shona. Hmm. And th- there is that, there's just a sense of of self-identity or cultural identity that people hate to give up. Sure. And I know we could go into, you know, that, that's really what we all do when mm-hmm. we come to Christ. We give up our, our old identity and take on a new identity. Yeah. But in other, in, I think in every culture, people don't want to give up their earthly identity for another earthly identity, but they will give up that identity for a spiritual identity yeah. when they realize that this is a truth yeah. that supersedes cultural identities on earth. Right, right. And I think they start to understand that this world is not their home. So there's, mm-hmm, you know, there's right. those two natures working inside of you. And I think that um, because our citizenship is in heaven, I think God works that into our hearts and lives. And I know that you guys understand that because a lot of gospel ministries who work internationally really have a sense of urgency when you see the times and what's going on in the world so that as many as possible can understand uh, the gospel as soon as possible. Now, how does technology figure in here? I mean, I'm a shortwave person. I'm a radio person. I love shortwave. I haven't cranked mine up for a while, and I think it's possible. I don't know. You can t- you tell me if shortwave was a, kind of uh, something that you guys utilized for some time. But now we got Wi-Fi and all this other uh, all these other avenues of communication. Um, is it still more of a low-tech ministry, or is, again, there's unreached people groups who don't have Wi-Fi, so where does technology fit in with all this? This, it has become so broad, hmm. and the access that we have, um, we still utilize shortwave uh, quite heavily, especially in, uh, in the South Asia region, and India, Nepal, Bhutan, <laughs> some of these countries, that's the only way hmm. that we can get in. 
And people out in the remote areas still utilize that. Okay. So other countries, um, FM is more accessible. Uh, the internet is becoming increasingly available okay. globally. Mm-hmm. And the, the number of internet-connected internet devices or mobile devices has just mushroomed in, in some of these countries. It, it is amazing. And so we used to refer to ourselves as a global radio ministry, mm-hmm. and we've now changed that where we use the term a global media ministry okay. because we are, we're doing more TV, more, more oh, video for okay. posting online and, and assisting ministries to develop like a social media presence. It's amazing the number of people in other countries that have access to social media. Mm. Um, and even with you know my own communications with our ministry partners around the world, um, it's not just email anymore. Uh, some of them prefer to communicate through WhatsApp. Sure. And it's it's no longer the, the, the time lapse or the lag between when I send a question or when I communicate <laughs> or ask for mm-hmm. a report and when I get it back. That communication is so much faster. Yeah. And what all that means, it just means that we need to be keenly aware in each culture, in each region, how are people consuming media? Where are they turning for the information? And wherever that is, that's where we need to be with the gospel. Yeah, yeah. And you do reach some, I would guess, some unreachable areas, too, uh, and radio. I love how this just sort of came about when, when a pastor was just utilizing radio and people said, why don't you do this or that? And I love what God has done uh, since then. And I'm familiar with Haiti, and I know that they have uh, Internet. It comes and goes. But also, for yeah. a while there, we were sending solar radios down there that have a crank on them so that anyone could have a radio, even if they don't have a generator. Uh, so are, there are options. Are there are there um, unreached groups where it is so isolated that something like that would work? There are, and even in in areas where they are not uh, completely isolated from broadcast media, we do utilize these mobile devices that are solar powered. Okay. And one of the advantages of that is that they can go in. They can be used by people in areas where they don't have electricity in their homes. Oh, okay. So, uh, you know, some people, they have to use purely battery power. Well, if they have a small solar-powered device and the memory capacity on that, it, it's incredible how much information can be put on there. We have used solar-powered devices that have the entire Bible on them in the language Ooh. of the people that we're giving them to. Wow. And in addition, have space on there for us to put teaching and additional material that or programming in their language that they can listen to. Wow! Wow! And so our, the the team, our what we call our boots on the ground, you know, they'll go out and they will distribute these. People will listen to them. They'll come back around. They'll discuss. Okay, what did you think about what you heard? What are you learning? And it's a, it's a tool for evangelism and discipleship. And then with a mobile laptop, we can plug that device right in, and they can say, "Okay, I've listened to everything that's on here. Mm. Well, let's let's get you some new material mm. on there. Let's take you to the next level of discipleship." That's fantastic because you're telling me something I've never heard of before that the, that there are solar devices that can have the Bible and teachings on. I have never heard of that, and that's wonderful. And so you have the staff who can update people with this need. Um, how you how do you do with staff? You have staff around the world, or is it mostly just in the states? We have a very small staff here in the U.S. And somebody once asked me, well, you know, I've been to other countries. I've never seen the tide. Well, you really never will because we do not, we do not duplicate ourselves in other countries. Okay. We help establish indigenous ministries. Mm. Mm. So if, if you would go to India... You may never hear of the tide, but you might get out into some villages and you might feel, see people say, hey, you know, yeah, I listen to the Good News Hour. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was the first area where we set up a studio and formed an indigenous ministry. And back then it was Gospel Tide Hour, so they called it Good News Hour. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but there's we have an indigenous board of directors there. We have paid staff there, not paid directly by us here in North America, but we subsidize the ministry there in India. Mm -hmm. So we send the funds to support that. We do pay directly the airtime invoices from here in the U.S. So they they get approximately 5% of their support from listeners in India. Okay. And that's the, the reason, you know, some people say, well, you know, shouldn't those who receive the ministry support the ministry? And that is very true. But when you have people living in abject poverty at a level that it's hard for us to comprehend here in the U S they do give generously, but what they give is it's, it's the widow's might. Sure. And the widow's might just won't pay the thousands of dollars we put into airtime, you know, mm-hmm. to the, the cost of broadcasting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's up to us to adopt those people and to mm-hmm. say, you know, we will pay for that. Mm-hmm. And what we, we, we do receive, uh, I take great joy in this ministry. I'm so grateful that God has allowed me to serve in a place mm-hmm. where I can have a hand in building his kingdom in the hearts of people all around the world. Yeah. Well, yeah, praise the Lord. He lets us do this stuff, doesn't he? It's just fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. uh, and the indigenous, uh, you know, the, the native missions is is really the way to go. But like, like you said, it's not Western influence. It, this is who you are. We honor who you are. We respect who you are. And we're going to bring you the gospel right where you are. And I th- I just really, really like that. Um, I look on your, on your site or your information that I got, but there are more than 7,000 languages spoken worldwide and 2,000 people groups that have been unreached by the gospel. Wow, what a great opportunity. And I think putting numbers with that is important for us in the West to understand. 7,000 languages worldwide, that's, that's quite a number. Um, what, are, what is the most remote area that, you, that the tide reaches? Um. Uh, that that's a little bit of a tough question. Okay. Um, I would say, like some of the villages and areas in India, also in Africa, especially in Mozambique, um, <clears throat> the the radio programming that we're doing there is reaching out into some very remote. And I I guess I should ask you to clarify, like, what do you mean by remote? Do you mean like as far away from us here, or sort of uh, isolated. Yeah, and, isolated. Difficult to reach maybe from yeah. terrain or just a, a, a people group that are isolated by choice that mm-hmm. may be a little bit resistant even. I don't know about the politics of all that, but uh, remote yeah. remote groups, hard to reach. Yeah, I, I would say probably two of, uh, or well, three, the more as I talk, things are coming to mind. Sure. Um, Mozambique is, is one area. Um Pakistan, there's a, one specific, you know, the Pashto people are extremely resistant to the gospel. Mm. Um, and then Bhutan, we, we cannot go into Bhutan. We have to rely on people in Bhutan, and we have to send that in by shortwave. Okay. There's no other way to get the gospel in there. Mm-hmm. So those are some of the more remote areas. Well, do you have, do you have, um, are there Bible ministries in any of these areas or is that, is it mostly just radio and we leave the Bible distribution to someone else or smuggling as it were to someone else? Uh, No, that's a, I kind of tell people that the radio, the media programs that we're helping these groups to produce and distribute and utilize in ministry is sort of the tip of the iceberg. The real ministry is what's going on when they are connecting and engaging in discipleship activities, Mm -hmm. helping people to embrace what they're hearing or viewing and take next steps. Okay. And so depending on the country, I've mentioned the portable media players, which will have discipleship teaching on that, which is especially helpful in what are called oral societies or in areas where, there is there are high levels of illiteracy. Okay. 
So if, if somebody can't read, giving them a Bible just isn't going to help them. Yeah. But yeah. giving them an audio Bible that mm. they can listen to is very helpful. Yeah. Well, that makes perfect so, sense. That makes perfect sense. Yep. Right. So being able to connect with people on the ground, provide them resources, literature in their own language, where that's applicable and appropriate. Some areas, especially in India, some of the languages, we do have correspondence courses that people can take, uh, providing Bibles, providing the uh, audio players with material on them. There's a whole lot that's going on. And the ultimate goal is to take somebody who has not been exposed to the gospel, who is uh, the first volley may have come in or their first touch may have been through a radio program or a short uh, video on social media, whatever that first touch is, to take them from the first touch to a committed follower of Christ who is part of a worshiping community, mm. so planting churches. Mm -hmm. And you know what, what we look at when we think of a church here, you know, we think of maybe a nice big fancy building, lots of people gathered in there, right. a band up front, and a, a preacher, and a whole, uh, just a, a formal thing like that. Uh, I can tell you there's a church in Thailand, it's called Turtle, it's in Turtle Swamp Village. There's another church that is the the church under the mango tree. <laughs> <laughs> The first mango church of the first mango tree, or something like that. <laughs> right, and and so there may only be five or six people gathering under that mango tree. Sure, but it's a group of committed believers who are growing together, worshiping together, mm -hmm. experiencing Christ together, and hopefully that will have a greater impact in the community. Uh, maybe even maybe only one or two of those people actually heard the gospel on the radio, but it kind of grows from there. Okay. Okay. Well, this I'm glad that you said all that because my final question before the break, which is only um, a minute or so away, was what about churches? And um, they, they plant them themselves, and I know this is maybe a long answer in a short period of time, but did they plant, they feel led to plant their own churches? Is that it? I mean, they feel led to gather? That is something that we we encourage okay. and try to facilitate. Okay. Um, and the the strategy we use, especially in India, is to send a village worker with a radio into a village to invite people to listen. Okay. And they form a listening club, nice. and then they are trained yeah. to lead discussions and to make disciples. And they will identify the strongest one or two converts okay. that they get in that group. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to disciple them to the place where they get the radio, they become the leader and, uh, be, in a sense, pastor that small group, and the village worker moves on to another okay. village with a radio. Okay. You know, I love I love what you're saying because it's so uplifting and encouraging. We Sometimes we feel in the West here that people aren't listening to the gospel. They're not open. They're going to church. They're going through the motions. And maybe they don't have that, that heart and that zeal that some of these uh, new converts have. And so... I love how uplifting this is to hear what God is doing around the world. Uh, so I am talking to Don Shank today from uh, the Tide Gospel Ministry. Um, and we're just talking about how God is working around the world through this organization who sounds like I'm pretty sure they don't want the credit for any of it, but they're going to give the glory to God for all of this. And so we're going to be back in two minutes and we're going to talk some more with Don about Pakistan, about Mozambique and so many other areas, what's going on. Well, persecution, too, because that's going on as well. So stay with me this morning. Uh, the Tide.org is, is the website, and we'll be back in two minutes with more with Don. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for Friday. It's Friday, March uh, 22nd. Uh, is it the 22nd? Yeah, I guess it is. Um, we're talking to Don Shank of, I know, my brain faded there for a second, uh, the Tide.org, and it is a global gospel radio ministry, and they are reaching people all over the world with the good news of Jesus Christ while we still can and while we can still work um, before the Lord comes to take us home. Um, Don, there was an uh, article last year. Fox asked you about persecution, and I have the article in front of me. It was last spring. 
Um, it says examples set by persecuted Christians in both is both inspiring and convicting, says Pennsylvania evangelist. That's you. Uh, how did that come about? Um, we work in parts of the world where there are, in some areas, entrenched belief systems that are not Christian and are anti they, The authorities want to keep Christianity out. Mm. Even people on the ground where where a country might say we're officially a secular country. For mm. example, Nepal is officially a secular nation. It okay. used to be a Hindi kingdom. Um, people are very much opposed to change coming in, especially if they don't understand that it is gospel truth. It mm. takes time for the Word of God to penetrate and change hearts. Sure. And so, yes, we do. Yeah, you know, I have... I've talked to people in India, and I have met face to face with some of them. Uh, a widow whose husband was beheaded because he was out preaching the gospel in the village, and he never made it home. Mm. Um, I've, I'll give you a story of what I think is one of my favorite stories. This happened uh, over ten years ago, but it's still relevant. When I was in India, a meeting with some of our uh, boots on the ground there. One of them came to me, and he couldn't speak English, but through a translator, he said, I just want to thank you for all the people you have in North America who are praying for us as we're out ministering. Mm. He was one of those church plant, uh, planting workers that I mentioned before the break that takes a radio out and forms a, a listening club and plants the churches. And he was doing a regular circuit that he would go on from village to village, and in the one village, some of the people came to him and they said, we've heard some of the others talking. They plan to ambush you in the forest. You should go. You should go back home. And he said to me, he said, well, he said there was a river on one side, a mountain on the other side. Wow. And it was either the path forward or turn around and go back. And he said, Jesus has oh. called me to tell others about him. And so I just went forward. Mm. And as I was walking through the forest... On the pass, I saw ahead a group of very menacing looking men, and I just prayed and walked. They never did anything. Mm. When he came back around, the, he found out that the other people in the village, when they realized he walked through, they said to these men, Well, why, why didn't you attack him? Why didn't you do what you said you were going to do? And they said, well, we were afraid of all the soldiers who were walking with him. <laughs> and uh. he said to me, he said, I know it's because wow. your people in North America are praying for us, mm. that their prayers, because of their prayers, God sent his angels to walk with me. Wow. Wow. Well. And so don't ever, you know, sometimes we kind of focus on the financial support, and we do need that. We can't operate without the financial support. Sure. And we kind of throw in prayer as kind of an aside. Yeah. But prayer is crucial to supporting the work at home, around the globe, wherever we want Jesus to make an impact. Yeah. Yeah. Prayer is an important part of that. Yeah, and what a great reminder it is. And families can do this. They can go country by country. When they have their family devotionals, they can say, okay, let's pray for this country today or that country tomorrow, this ministry, that ministry. And it gives their kids a global mindset, um, right. not just a Christian worldview, but that God so loved the world. Uh, and there's so much more. And, you know, anytime I've traveled, Don, and uh, it's not been a lot. It's been a while since I've gone anywhere um, outside of this country, but you see all the people and you say, wow, there are so many people in the world and God keeps track of them all, but it's mind boggling how huge the world really, really is. And so you are a great reminder of that. And I think I want to encourage parents to take time with their kids and their family to have a list, have a globe, have a map, um, Absolutely. And, and, you know, and point this is, this is, they'll learn geography too. And they'll learn about God's heart for, for people um, by pointing, say, we're going to pray for these people today and, and keep a notebook of who you prayed for and, and have your kids have this mindset. I think that's such a great encouragement. So I'm so glad you went there. Um, I want to ask you about just, just some, uh, a phrase that I found in, in some of the notes here. 
Um, the Tide Ministry has been recording and broadcasting gospel programming into multiple regions on three continents with content in over 20 heart languages uh, spoken by millions of people in various countries. What is, what is a heart language? What do you guys consider that? It's very, very simply put, it's, it's the language you were born to speak. Okay. It's, it's the language that you kind of, that connects with your heart. Mm. Okay. Um, and it's, you know, yeah. we, we do minister in areas, for example, in India, there's um, millions, millions of people that can understand Hindi, mm-hmm. but it wouldn't necessarily be their heart language. They understand it because it's, it's one of the most widely used national languages in India. Okay. And so we're out in villages, and one of our focuses is on the the marginalized or those who really otherwise wouldn't have access to the gospel. And so some of the people groups where there's over a billion people in India, we're ministering or putting a program out there for a group that might only be three million of them. Hmm. But, you know, when we say only three million— Jesus died for each and every one of those three million. His blood is just as relevant as it is for the 400 million who grew up speaking Hindi. Mm -hmm. And Jesus relates to them in their own language, their heart language. They might be able to understand Hindi and could receive the gospel in Hindi, Mm -hmm. but their heart language may be Santali or Guruk or a (laughs) Botada, one of these other languages. And so that's what, to to take the gospel to them in a language that they will connect with right okay. away. Okay. Okay, and I'm not sure if you know the answer to this necessarily, but you would be someone I think probably would. A persecution in India uh, at the hand of Hindus t- or towards Christian, uh, mm-hmm. for a while it seemed like there was uh, pretty severe. Is that still going on, uh, on on a pretty large scale, or what's what's going on over there right now? It has gone in waves okay. over the past few decades, and it is becoming worse again. Um, mm. And that is because the, the current government and leadership in India really wants to establish India as a Hindu nation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you go back in the whole history of that whole region, the political machine and power is kind of set the stage for that in a way, because uh, Pakistan, India, uh, West Bang- or, yeah, Bangladesh, all of that used to be considered uh, India. Yeah. And when it was divided up into smaller countries, uh, it was divided along, primarily along religious lines. Okay. So Pakistan was separated off because that's where the Muslims mostly were, same as um, Bangladesh, primarily Muslim. India was Hindu. Many people don't know that another name for India is Hindustan, hmm. which means place of Hindus. Hmm. So they they own it. They say it's theirs. They do not want any other religion there. And so both Muslims and Christians in India are persecuted. Hmm. Oh, interesting. That's very interesting. Um, I want to travel just a little bit. We're in the same uh, area, uh, mm. Pakistan. I want to talk about Pakistan um, okay. because it's overwhelmingly Muslim. Only 1% of residents in Pakistan identify as Christians. I've also heard of uh, a lot of persecution uh, that life for Christians over there is different, uh, is very difficult. Um, they're number seven on Open Doors World Watch list. Uh, a lot of abuse, and they have uh, terrible blasphemy laws, and they will use those to target minority groups, especially Christians. Uh, are you able to come alongside, is the tide able to come alongside these persecuted Christians? Uh, how how bad is it in Pakistan? I've heard it's pretty bad. It is, and in some areas, <clears throat> you know, they've had homes uh, completely destroyed, burned, ransacked, mm. Mm. Uh, believers being uh, killed. Now, I've been to Pakistan, and uh, it's. I, I've been in areas where I didn't feel a sense of animosity, but I was with believers. They took me into an area I visited in someone's home, 
and it was a a neighborhood. Um, you could call it like a suburb, what we call suburb here. And they told me that this suburb is known as a Christian suburb. So you're kind mm-hmm. of uh, free. Although as we were driving to this gentleman's home, he pointed out his church and there was a big memorial on uh, kind of a granite stone there. And he said, that's because a suicide bomber came into that church and one of the church members recognized in out in the yard what was going to happen oh. and actually tackled him and sacrificed his life. The bomb went off. Um, wow. I forget how many others were actually injured or killed, mm-hmm. but if it had that suicide bomber gotten inside the church building, it would have been so much worse. Yeah. How long ago was that? That um, I was in, like I said, in 2018, and okay. that had happened uh, a couple of years before that. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty heavy, but, um, you know. That, you know, that, you know, just because I'm sharing something that happened maybe eight eight years ago, it's still ongoing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, the you know, the blasphemy laws. They have two specific laws on their books that you cannot say anything derogatory about the Quran or about the Prophet Muhammad. Mm. Sure. And even uh, most recently, I saw somebody was uh, had like some print, was wearing a shirt with some print on it, and some people claimed that that was a quote from the Quran, and it was being dishonored by being worn on this shirt. Mm. Okay. Um, and so mm-hmm. that that person was actually attacked. Um, yeah. So it's it's very hard because believers have to be very careful how they talk because anything could be misconstrued mm-hmm. to it, even if you just say if you would compare Jesus to Muhammad that could be blasphemy. Sure. Wow. Well, we need to pray for the people in Pakistan because that's a, that's a hot spot right now. Um, also, you are producing 15-minute gospel programs in several languages in uh, Pakistan, and people can access, access those through the Internet. Um, we've we've yeah. just made that switch. Okay. okay. Yeah, that, that's one of the areas where we've realized we were <clears throat> broadcasting, sending it in on shortwave, And uh, our team on the ground had come back and said, you know, we're really not getting a good response to this. But um, more and more people have mobile phones. Uh, The last I saw, it's up over 80% of the population in Pakistan has a cell phone or some type of mobile device. And they're able to access, you know, these countries, in, in some sense, some of these countries that are most adamantly opposed to the gospel are actually enabling the spread of the gospel or are facilitating it to some degree because they are putting on a hard push for the sake of education and the development of society to get internet available throughout the country. Yeah. So hmm. that opens up a channel for us to be able to get gospel programming online for people in those countries. That's great. So that's what we're doing in Pakistan. Instead of having those radio programs to broadcast, Mm -hmm. we're creating shorter segments for outreach through social media or other online uh, platforms like YouTube. Yeah, right. Wow, technology. We love it and we hate it, right? We have a love-hate yeah. relationship <laughs> with technology. When it works, yay. But it, it's also something that, you know, the enemy uses to, to ruin people's lives and hearts and minds as well. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, but but this is great. I, I love how this is sort of a, a twofold thing because it's a lifeline to believers who are just, who need to be encouraged, but it's also the gospel for unbelievers uh, who, who have not heard it before. Uh, so uh, it's just wonderful to hear what you guys are doing. Um you have something called a, a diamond vision too, and let's talk about in the time we have left. Let's talk about uh, the diamond vision, it, uh, amplify, magnify, that sort of thing. What what is your, the diamond vision, and how can we understand that better? The diamond vision was actually, you know, when we had our seventy fifth anniversary, what were, what did we want to focus on? Sure. 
And those those were the, the five aspects that we identified. <clears throat> and we actually just last year had another, at the end of the year, had another kind of a strategic planning session with our board. And we've decided, oftentimes a vision is, you know, we'll have a vision for a specific time period, and then we kind of like cast vision for the next few years. And we've decided that those five points of our diamond vision, we want to make them sort of guiding principles okay. for the ministry. Okay. So they will kind of endure whatever our next vision that we're looking at for expansion. Mm-hmm. Um, but amplify would be to just increase the amount of outreach, whether it's additional language programming or <clears throat> more than one program in that language, you know, multiple programs on different aspects. Uh, that's one of the most common things we hear from listeners is, you know, we want to hear more. Okay. So being able to do more, and as I said, either that can be new people groups or helping to increase the variety of gospel media available to an existing area where we're ministering. Mm -hmm. Magnify, obviously amplify. uh, As we do that, our expenses increase, our costs. Magnify has more to increase the number of people who are engaging with us on an ongoing basis to help support and partner with us to get the gospel out there and to provide uh, especially the financial resources that our partners in these countries lead. Uh, then we also go to solidify is looking at making sure that we're, this is where I said about the tip of the iceberg, um, amplify is kind of making a bigger tip on the iceberg. That means we've got to increase the discipleship activities, strengthen the structures on the ground to enable believers to grow in their faith and to, to enable them to find a church or to plant a church or to be a part of a, a group of a worshiping community. Mm-hmm. Verify is we want to make sure that what we're doing, or what we say we're doing, we are actually doing. Sure. So we do have a very robust mm-hmm. uh, reporting system and metrics that we ask our partners to keep track of and to submit to us on a quarterly basis. And we want to be able to continue to develop that in ways that we can have the assurance and provide our donors the assurance that what they are supporting is actually happening. Yeah. And then the fifth and, you know, the the penultimate part of the diamond is everything we do is to glorify God. Yeah. 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 Your reward awaits, right? Um, Right. And that, that's that's the goal of all of these things. Now, there's a, a, um, a third, I think it's the third annual race to share the gospel. Does that take place? Because it's running, walking, biking, hiking, swimming, uh, you know, to make an impact in the lives of, of so many people around the world. Is that a local event, race to share the gospel in Pennsylvania? This year is the first time we are doing an in-person event that will be local. But we are also continuing to do it as a virtual event that anyone anywhere in the world can actually okay. participate. Okay. Um, and so it, it started as virtual in the first years because we were just coming out of COVID and it was, oh. you know, gatherings weren't conducive to that. <clears throat> and we've had a lot of people participate. They sign up online at the tide.org and register. You can create a team if you want to do it together as a team. Um, but the idea is just to do something to help share the gospel. Um, if you do the the in person here in Chambersburg, it's going to be a regular 5K race. Okay. But the online, you've got 16 days to complete 13 miles. Hmm. And what we do is we have set up each year we focus on a different country, and um, we have one staff member who kind of sets up sets this up and organizes it and chooses a virtual route through that country so as you're running you'll pass mile markers and if you're doing it virtually you'll simply get an email notification that you passed another mile marker and with that notification comes a prayer point something to pray about for the the people there or the environment the the religious environment some element is identified Okay. So on the virtual race, if you're 
running a mile a day or walking a mile a day, every day you're going to get something to pray about for mm. for that particular region. Okay. That's great. And I see that it says the goal is to raise 15000 and that's incredibly uh, modest amount, uh, Don. But it, it has to do with the Balkans region and uh, in Eastern Europe, which is mostly Muslim. Is, is the Balkan mostly Muslim, or what, what's their demographic? There's, there's, there is a heavy presence, a, a heavy Catholic presence, okay. and a heavy mm. Orthodox Church presence, and then also a heavy Muslim presence. But it's an area of the world where, even back to the time of the Crusades, you know, we associate the Crusades primarily with things happening in, in Palestine and that region, Israel, that part of the world. But the Balkans was kind of the pathway for that, and a lot of religious conflict took place in that area. Mm. Um, and the political turmoil was taken there. Many of the countries that are now Balkan countries were once part of Yugoslavia. Right. But because different people groups, slightly different languages, they've broken apart and they're now independent countries. And right. uh, I want, some people have challenged me, and I want to say, when I say that the Catholic Church there, very often it is more of a political entity in mm. some of these countries than a faith. Mm. Okay, and and so when we when we look at these countries, as far as people who would claim to be born again to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it's less than one percent. Mm, I see. Yeah, and you know Albania, where we have been ministering, was at one time officially an atheist country, hmm. and so our our the reason we're focusing on the Balkans with our race this year is because. We've been in Albania and Kosovo since uh, 2015. Last year, we expanded into the Republic of North Macedonia, which is just above Greece and right. neighbors Albania. Right. Now we're moving northward into Serbia, Croatia, Montenegro, and Bosnia and Herzegovina. We have plans to go into each of those countries. And so that's where we need the expansion funding yeah. to get into those countries. Well, you know, we're going to pray for you guys that, that you are able to do that because so many areas need Jesus. And they, people need Jesus in this country, too, but there's, they've been inoculated by religion just enough to, to not even know that they need Jesus. Um, we just have a minute and a half left, Don. It went so fast this morning. Uh, you have leadership training, uh, short-term mission trips. Is there anything you just want to throw out there, um, how people can get in touch with you, uh, social media, that sort of thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, you got any last yeah, I words would, for us? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. <clears throat> something is really on my heart, and it's a it's an additional thing that we're doing. It's called the Have You Heard Challenge. Okay. Where we're challenging people to ask others, "Have you heard about Jesus?" Okay. In other words, we're focused on sharing the gospel overseas. Let's do it here too. Yeah. Let's let, let's elevate our spiritual lives. Yeah. We live in a society where materialism is thrown at us, promoted, and our spiritual lives are we're kind of encouraged to internalize that. Yeah, right. And, you know, if I meet somebody out in the street and have a conversation with them, I probably know who a little bit about their family, where they live, where they work, isn't that? But it often stops short of what do you believe? Mm-hmm. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you have uh, hope in your etern- in eternity? And so... Yeah. Um, Engaging with the Tide Ministry. If you want to know more about it, go to the Tide dot org. Okay. We do also have a, a Facebook page. If you just search the Tide, you'll okay. find us there. Um, Don, but, I, we're we're out of time, and I just thank you so much for okay. your for your time. <laughs> uh, and again, the Tide dot org. We didn't get a chance to talk about Mozambique, but you can find that on their website if you're interested in that. Don, we appreciate you so much, and Lord bless you and the work you're doing for the kingdom. Uh, so thank thanks you. for thanks for being on. All right, so Monday we have a fresh podcast with Crash and J.B. Hickson talking about Holy Week because that is next on our calendar coming up. Good Friday is next weekend. Tuesday we have Kim Sorgius for the first half. She's speaking at the Homeschool Conference, April 4th and 5th. 
And then headlines the second half. Wednesday, Sean Patrick Terrio, a replay. Thursday, my guest is Todd Nettleton, so we'll discuss more global things about the church. Pete Garcia is back with us on Friday. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Have a great weekend. Thank you.